I was a student when I made my first visit to London. It was the summer of 1997. I was poor and on a budget. I came just for the day on a National Express coach from Cambridge. I was a little uneasy because the driver spoke loudly in a Cockney accent, had a shaven head and tattoos that snaked up his arms from his wrists and disappeared into his short sleeves. Dark thoughts of what skinheads did to black people in Europe entered my mind. Here you go, darling, he said as he handed me my change. I was disarmed. London lived in my imagination long before I saw it. On that first visit, I wanted to see everything. From the top of several hop-on hop-off buses, I saw Pudding Lane and Westminster Abbey, the Old Bailey, the sparkling dirty Thames, and the many sights and places that I knew from books and televisions. By four in the afternoon, I was London glutted and sight sore. Coming up is Marble Arch, said our tour guide. I immediately thought of Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah. My best friend, David Otterwell, had introduced me to his music the month before, only for Buckley to drown a few weeks after I first heard him. I hopped off the bus and walked into Hyde Park from the Marble Arc entrance. It was as good a place as any to eat my sandwich lunch. As I walked into the park, I almost became part of a crowd of Hare Krishna followers. The small enthusiastic crowd was mainly middle-aged, the men in white linen trousers and tunics, the women looking incongruous in clothes from two continents separated by a vast ocean. They wore saris accessorized with colorful woven bags from Latin America. They thrust up their arms and danced their way through the park as everyone but the tourists ignored them. I walked away from the Hare Krishnas and found myself at Speaker's Corner. I listened to a bearded Christian evangelist preaching hell and brimstone in such soft tones that he did not appear to be particularly convinced of the impending doom he prophesied. There was also a member of the International Socialists' Organization who talked as though the Berlin Wall was still to fall and a group of students campaigning against a multinational that was forcing infant formula on women in developing countries, making me feel terribly guilty because all I could think of was one of the multinational's famed chocolate bars. I took that as a prompt to have my late lunch and walked to eat it in the loveliness of the Rose Garden. After my meal, I turned right and found myself in Rotten Row. I felt immediately homesick for Zimbabwe. There are not many Rotten Rows in the world, and one of them is in Harare. I spent an hour wandering in the happy days in Hyde Park. I have visited Hyde Park many times since then, and I've come to love other sites that I missed that day. Particularly, the moving Holocaust memorial with its text from the Book of Lamentations. But the charm of the first visit has never left me. It is one of my favorite places in London. Speakers' Corner is famously associated with freedom of speech, but to me, it speaks to the quality that I love most about the British, their tolerance for eccentricity. And that day showed me another quality that I love in big city dwellers, not just Londoners, but those of other big cities too. Coming from a city in the guise of a village, where to be present is to invite attention and loud comment on your clothes, your hair, your very being, I love that there was an accepted code of behavior about being private and public, and that I could disappear into my own world and up in the middle of a communal park. I love Hyde Park also because it reminds me of home, not only because of Rotten Row, but because it gives me an idea of what my city's planners had in mind when they put the Harare Gardens, my city's largest park, in the middle of the city. As I left the park through Hyde Park Corner that day in 1997, I walked away with an idea in my mind of the kind of place that my city could have become, of the kind of place that Harare still could be when, and if ever, it grows up.